Hear the word of the psalmist in Psalm 147, verses 1 to 11. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble but casts the wicked on the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. His pleasure is not in the strength of a horse, nor his delight in the legs of a man. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Good morning and welcome to all those who have chosen to tune into Unity Hills Church at Home this morning. It's a privilege and a pleasure to share this time with you today. I trust and pray that you are all safe and well and coping with the COVID situation we find ourselves in at this time. If you aren't coping too well, or maybe even feeling a little bit depressed, or just plain unsure of what's going on, and how we're going to survive this isolation life we've been asked to live, please, if you need help, please call someone you trust and feel you can talk to. Because we are church, we are family, and we're all in this situation together. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Father God, we praise and honour your holy name. We thank you, Lord, that you love each and every one of us so much that you were prepared to take our sin onto that despicable cross so long ago. Father, this morning we bring to your cross the things that are worrying us. Sickness, illness, COVID-19, job security, and anything else that is of concern to us and our families and place them and ourselves in your hands. Father, even though we're worshipping from home, we claim our homes as holy ground and welcome your presence here with us. Thank you, Lord. You are such a good God and you have and want such good things for us. Come, Holy Spirit, come and move amongst us. Father, I pray against any distractions of our mind and or our hearts that may get in the way of meeting with you. Lord, let nothing distract us from what you have in store for us this morning. We are your sons and your daughters. We're here in our homes to meet with you and to take our place at your banquet table. Have your way, Father. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Amen. Over the past three weeks, Nathan has got us prepared and ready dressed in the full armour of God, including a new elastic band in our underpants. For me, the main take-home message from the series is make sure we are daily dressed in the full armour of God, stand firm against whatever the evil one has to throw at us, and when all is done, be standing firm. I believe the message that Barb will bring to us shortly dovetails beautifully with Nathan's series, armour up, stand firm, then she goes on with the next step, focus on Jesus, perseverance in our walk and relationship with Jesus, and in doing so, we're in the right space to win the prize that he has set out before us, eternity with him. Our first song this morning is, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. It's one we played last time we were here. It's a great song with great words and is so relevant to this morning's message. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. 
for my life is wholly bound to his. Our challenge is this, really? We sing these words, but do we believe them and live them? And likewise, it goes on, all the glory evermore to him when the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When we sing, yet not I, we should really be singing, it's nothing that I've ever done or deserve. Likewise, when we sing, but through Christ in me, we indeed should be singing, but by grace, Jesus can work through me, even despite of me. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. My hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to Him. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, whole is mine, yet not I, but Christ in me. But I am not forsaken For by my side The Savior He will stay I labor on The weakness and rejoicing For in my need His power is displayed For this I hold My shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead oh the night when one and I will overcome yet not I but Christ in me No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been. Jesus now and ever is my plea All oh, the chains are released I can sing Now I'm free Yet not I But through Christ in me With every breath I long to follow Jesus For He has said That He will bring me home And day by day I know He will renew me Until I stand with joy Before the throne To this I hold My hope is only Jesus to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yes, not I, but to Christ in me. To this 
I hope, my hope is only Jesus. Oh, the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, this my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but to Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but to Christ in me. Yet not I, but to Christ in me. Remember how the psalmist started today? Verse 1 said, Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, how pleasant and fitting to praise him. And the first part of verse 7 says, Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. We can do just that as we sing our next song, I praise the name of the Lord our God, I praise his name forever. For endless days we will sing his praise, O Lord, O Lord our God. The hairs on the back of my neck still stand up when I sing the next verse. My prayer is that when it's time for me to go home with Jesus, I'll be able to roar with the angels. Then on the third at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. O trampled death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. O praise the name of the Lord our God. I cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus died and bled for me I see his wounds, his hands, his feet My Savior on that cursed tree His body lay and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and still alone Oh, praise the name of the Lord, oh God. Oh, praise his name forever. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, God. Then on the third outbreak of dawn the son of heaven rose again oh trample death where is your sting the angels roar for Christ the King
shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forever. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Hello everybody, it's nice to talk to you. You know, I've missed you all. I hope you're all doing okay and I hope that during this time of isolation you've found some really new things to do and interesting things and you've enjoyed spending extra time with your family. But won't it be so nice when we can all come back together again and worship together as a church family? You know, last week Pastor Nathan introduced the topic that we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks and that's the armour of God. Now when I say armour, what do you think of? Do you think of a picture like this? This is a Roman soldier. He's got his helmet and his shield, his tunic and his sword. And he used to dress like this to be prepared to go out for battle. Now a lot of wars going on in those days and they needed to do everything they could to protect themselves when they went out to fight. But you know, in the Bible, Jesus says that we have to wear the armor of God. And I don't think he wants us to dress like that. So I'll just read the Bible verse to you so you can think about it. It says in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13, So put on all of God's armour. Evil days will come. You know, they might even be starting now. We've got tough stuff to deal with. But you will be able to stand up to anything. And after you've done everything you can, with God's help, with his armour, you'll still be standing. In other words, you can come through any battle that you have to face if you're wearing God's armour. Well, God's armour is not physical like this. We don't have to wear helmets and shields. His armour is more to do with our attitudes and our behaviour. It's a spiritual battle that he's talking about when he says we have to wear his armour. Our battle is against sin and against wrong, and against temptation, and against making choices, good choices, bad choices. How are we going to live? Are we going to live the way Jesus wants and be safe and protected? So he's given us his armour, and each week we're going to teach you about one of them. My job today is to teach you about the belt of truth. The belt of truth. Do you have a belt? We don't really wear them much these days. But when I was a teenager, we sure did. And I remember one day I had this great big yellow thick belt made of leather and it had a lovely big buckle in it that did it up. And when I wore it, I had my white shirt and my blue skirt and my bucket, my belt around the middle. And I felt really smart. I felt like it finished me off and I had a really nice, smart uniform. So the belt was like the topping off, the finishing off. It was like a bit of a fashion icon, item. But most people wear their belts, and you probably have worked it out, is to keep their pants from falling down. And a belt was really good because you'd put your jeans on and you'd put your belt on, but if you went out for a meal and you ate too much, and you got a bit fat, you could actually undo the button and hide it under your belt, and no one would really know that your pants didn't fit too well. And the same on the other, on the other hand, if you lost weight, and you started to feel a bit skinny, you could just pull the belt a little bit tighter, and it would still keep your pants in place. So a belt was to make sure that you felt safe and comfortable and your clothes were all in place when you went out in public. And a friend of mine used to hang his keys off his belt and so he would never lose them. I thought that was a pretty good idea too. 
So boots had a lot of good functions. But for this soldier, a Roman soldier, and this was a bit like the belt that he would wear, it had some other purposes as well. First of all, it was, um, it was where he had his scabbard, which held his sword. So when he went out to war with all of his armour on and he held his shield, he could race out and when he needed to raise his sword, he'd pull it out of his scabbard and he'd be there to fight and when he was finished he could put it away. And he had his weapon with him all the time. And if he didn't put his belt on when he went out to fight, he didn't have his weapon with him, which would be a terrible, terrible thing, probably cause a lot of illness and injury to himself. I also was told when I did some reading that the belt had a lot of markings on it. They were things that sort of said, this soldier belongs to me, or these are some of the wonderful feats he'd done in his, in his fighting days, and sort of was a mark of ownership. Well, that's an interesting one too. So it showed who he belonged to and who he was fighting with and for. Another one was that soldiers were all different shapes and sizes. So when they had a tunic, it might have been a bit long for some and a bit short for others. So they could hitch it up to get it to the right level. The belt held it in place. So it wasn't too long, it wasn't too short, it was very comfortable. And that belt kept his uniform in place. And the most important reason that he wore his belt was though, was because after putting on all the bits of armour, it completed his armour, his uniform. It kept it in place, it kept him strong, and it kept him functioning. What Jesus said, we need to wear the belt of truth. And I think that means that the word of God, what Jesus has told us and how he's shown us to live, needs to be the central part of our thinking so that whenever we are coming across a temptation, a battle, some form of decision we have to make, we can make a decision based on God's help. He will give us the wisdom we need if we trust in his truth, if we have his belt of truth around us. I just want to read you this to finish. It says, the belt is like the truth we find in God's word. That truth helps us to keep our lives in order. It keeps us focused on God and it helps put everything in its proper place. So let's centre our lives around the truth of God's word. And you know what? It won't let us down. God won't let us down. And we'll be prepared to face anything in our lives. I reckon it would be nice if you could talk to your families about what you've just what I've just shared with you. Talk to them about what they think the belt of truth is and how can we actually wear a belt of truth in our daily lives. And I think you probably got one of these in a little pack. I hope you did. And one of these. And I hope that last week you were able to decorate your person outline or even make one of yourself life size. Who knows what you did. Well, we're going to put a different piece of armour onto our, our soldier every week. And that will remind us of the things that we're learning about. Well, today, you've got to make the belt of truth. So in your pack, you'll see a little pink or purple piece of felt. And we've got a button there to put as the buckle. Now, if you've got better things to use at home, you do that. Or if you want to decorate it, put little markings on it that make it yours, do that too. Use your imagination. And I'm really looking forward to seeing these soldiers that we are making week by week. So when this, uh, this is finished and we come back to church, bring your little man along or your woman along with its armour of God on it and we can talk about what we've learned. So take care everyone, stay safe, give my love to your families and we'll see you soon. Bye. Let us pray. Lord, as we come to you in prayer, we're reminded that you're the one who spoke and the whole universe was created. You're the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and yet you're our Father, our Abba. We bring to you our concerns for what is happening across the earth, for the wars that are ongoing in many places and the many people who are displaced because of this. People whose only place to live are in refugee camps with little resources and often little hope. We pray for those who are being persecuted for their faith, those Christians who have been denied aid during the coronavirus time because of their faith. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in China, Korea, Iraq, and other nations where it's becoming more and more difficult for them, that you would protect them and their families, and when their governments would banish your presence, 
Instead, let your purposes prevail and people flourish nevertheless. We pray for those people who are struggling with the challenges of coronavirus, those who are hungry and cold, for those who have lost hope. Lord, may you show each of us what we can do to help others, that we don't just lavish on ourselves wants when we already have our needs and so many people who have little or nothing. We thank you that we live in this nation, that we have a government that puts value on each of our lives. May you give Scott Morrison and his government wisdom and discernment. Let it be that out of this time of hardship, grief for some and inconvenience for others, that you will draw to yourself those who haven't known you, that those who do not know you will be drawn closer to you. Wake up, we Christians in our nation, to the hour that we live in. May it be that we will be as the wise virgins and have oil in our lamps and looking and ready for our bridegroom. We pray for those who've lost their jobs, for those who have struggled with social distancing and being apart from loved ones, for the elderly, especially those who live alone. We think of the many people who are struggling in this hard time with health issues, those who have had operations delayed. We pray for ourselves here at Unity Hill. Let it be that when we come back together, that we'll be all the stronger, all the closer to each other and to your heartbeat from this challenging time. Help us to keep track of those amongst us who need encouragement and support. May you place on our minds and in our hearts those we need to help in some practical way. Thank you so much, Lord, that as your people, even though we haven't been able to meet together in a building as the body of Christ, you're with us every moment in every situation that each one of us are in. You are our rock. Our lives are built on you and we know that nothing can blow us off the rock of you, Jesus, even if it sometimes feels as if we may be teetering. That you're our fortress, a place of protection. You surround us and you're our deliverer. You will bring us through just as you did your people so long ago through the Red Sea and on dry ground. You knew each of us when we were in our mother's womb. You know how many hairs on our heads. You have a plan and a purpose for us. And you say that in our weakness, your strength is made apparent. Please, Lord, use each of us to be a light to others in whatever place you have planted us, that we can be used by you to bring hope and salvation to others. May your will be done and may your name be lifted high across the earth, in our nation, in this state, in our towns, in our homes and in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The first Bible reading this morning <clears throat> is from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's throw, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so e easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you would not grow weary and lose heart. Our next reading is back in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Jesus' name. This indeed is the word of the Lord. I read just the other day that if you introduce a song that doesn't need any introduction, you do it a misservice. This song needs no introduction. Let's sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Oh, 
soul you are weary and troubled no light in the darkness you see there's light for a look at the savior and life more abundant and free turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace though death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there or us sin has no more dominion for more than conquerors Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace His word shall not fail you he promised believe him and all will be well then go to a world that is dying his perfect salvation to tell turn your eyes upon jesus Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory We have over these last weeks been shown by Nathan the importance of us being equipped with the armour of God. Thankfully we have a God who gives us all we need to not only survive in the battles of life but to have victory in who we are in him. Today we're going to ask ourselves where is our focus? Have you often wondered or ever wondered when watching a circus why animal trainers would carry a stool when they go into a cage of lions. They have whips and pistols, but they also carry a stool. Apparently this is their most in important tool. The lion tamer holds the stool by the back and thrusts the legs towards the face of the wild animal. The lion tries to focus on four. A kind of um, paralysis overwhelms the animal and it becomes weak and disabled because its attention is fragmented. And so it can be with us. We have good intentions with our faith, but there are times when we can become easily distracted. We may become weak. We can be prey to whatever would come along our way that can take us from our walk with Jesus that would take our focus away from putting him first in our lives. During the time of coronavirus, when we've been encouraged to stay at home, to socially distance ourselves from others, it's been easy to feel as if something's been taken away from us. And surely, for those who have lost jobs and are ill, or those who've lost their lives or loved ones, that is heartbreaking and very real. But for others of us, whether we realise it or not, we have in fact been handed a gift by God. We've been given a divine reset opportunity. Over the weeks when our lives have changed, for some dramatically, it may have caused us to pause and to consider what are our priorities. As we've been going at a slower pace, 
It's enabled us to perhaps even appreciate each other more. You hear stories of families spending more time together, eating meals and playing games. Their lives have indeed become enriched. As Christians, perhaps we've been able to slow down and even to focus on Jesus more, to contemplate what is really important in life. Dictionary.com defines focus as a central point, as of attraction, attention or activity, to concentrate, to direct one's efforts or attention towards. How easy is it for us to lose our focus on Jesus? We can get inspired by a Sunday, a sermon on a Sunday morning and have good intentions, but then the busyness of life takes over. How ironic now, though, that a lot of the distractions, such as sport, socialising, etc., all good things in themselves, have been taken away for a period of time. We're told in Colossians 3.14, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And 2 Corinthians 4.18 Fix your eyes straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet and take only ways that are firm. And Hebrews 3.1 Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest, whom we confess. So these verses tell us to set our minds on things above and not on earthly things. Fix our eyes, fix our gaze, fix our thoughts on Jesus. In other words, focus on him and not let all that is twirling around in the periphery distract us. Our severely intellectually disabled daughter rarely makes eye contact. Her eyes quite skillfully avoid this. But once in 30 years, she looked me in the eyes and she smiled. My heart leapt for joy and I've never forgotten it. Because she can't talk, Dean and I are very focused on her needs. Rel can't help her disability and in a, in a different way, she does look to us. And in eternity, we're sure that we'll, we'll get to hear her speak and relate together. We both adore her and are all the time seeking relationship with her, meeting her needs, loving her. But you know, it can be lonely in a relationship when the other person doesn't appear to be focused on you. You go on loving, but you just yearn that that other person would respond. And I wonder how, whether that could be how it is with Jesus. That is yearning for eye contact with us, for us to focus on him and all he's done for us. Most of us do have the ability to focus, but perhaps sometimes it's the lack of determination which may make it harder. We want to, but we just get easily distracted. Jesus set an example for us on being focused. Luke 9, verse 51 says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He knew the mission he had, And no matter what distractions, he would not deviate. He had his eyes on the ultimate goal. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. And even the life he led tells us that he had his eyes totally on achieving his father's purposes. He didn't get caught up with diversions along the way, which he easily could have. He always was in close relationship with his father, heard from him and achieved his plans. Athletes can teach us a lot, as they'll do whatever is needed to achieve in their chosen sport. They'll set their faces toward the goal, no matter what cost to themselves. I think most of us struggle to relate when we hear of the swimmers who get up in the early hours and will, no matter what the weather, train for hours on end, and long-distance runners out in the elements, pushing their bodies relentlessly. They do this because they have a goal, and they're prepared to pay whatever the cost to themselves to achieve that. In everyday life, we can have goals, such as preparing for a wedding, having a house built, financial goals, getting health restored, holidays, study, getting through a busy week, sometimes just getting through a busy day, and these are good to have. We can perhaps ask ourselves today, do we have a goal with our faith? 
If so, would this take us into eternity with Jesus? What is most important to us and where is our focus mostly? In Philippians 3, 12 to 14, Paul says, I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. Brother, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And 2 Corinthians 4.18 So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And Hebrews 12.2 Let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. These verses speak determination of a goal set, and once this is done, it touches all that we do and all of who we are. Many years ago, a man hired an experienced guide to lead him on a hike into the Swiss Alps. After many hours, they came to a high and remote mountain pass. To the man's dismay, he saw that the path had almost been washed out. What could he do? To the left was a sheer rock. To his right, a precipice that dropped nearly a thousand feet. Looking down, the man felt his head growing faint and his knees beginning to buckle. At that moment, the guide shouted, Don't look down or you're a dead man. Keep your eyes on me and where I put my feet, put yours there as well. The man did as he was instructed and soon he passed from danger to safety. No one knows what lies ahead for any of us. We all have our plans and our dreams, but the times and the seasons of life are in God's hands. Sooner or later we'll come to a dangerous pass where the way ahead seems to be washed out. At that moment we can panic and fall into trouble or we can focus on Jesus and mark carefully his steps before us. We can follow him into all that he has prepared for us. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. We are pilgrims on a journey, not a tourist just strolling through life. According to dictionary.com, a pilgrim is a person who journeys, especially a long distance, to some sacred place as an act of religious devotion. A tourist is defined as a person who's a travelling, especially for pleasure. In the world we've lived in, pleasure has been lifted high. We've had the opportunity to be endlessly entertained and run the risk of being lured off the path that we would choose to be on. As we determine to focus on Jesus and his word, we can find that we don't need to live our lives as the world does. I believe we have been called to wake up to the fact that we don't need to live our lives either in fear. One of the enemy's most popular weapons that he uses against us is fear, worry, anxiety, and these can threaten to overwhelm us. And haven't we seen that during these last weeks? People so bound up in fear that they've stripped supermarkets of toilet paper and other essentials. I've never been able to understand that one. Across the earth are wars, conflicts, persecution, violence, crime, natural disasters, terrorism, unemployment division, the coronavirus pandemic and economic uncertainty. We can fear for our future, for our children's future, for our families for our financial security and our safety. As I've mentioned before, during a time of deep heartache years ago, I struggled with fear and worry. But through time, I began to find that the things that once would have made me anxious no longer did. It didn't happen quickly, but over the months as I focused on the Word of God, spoke Bible verses out loud and claimed them for myself, they became a part of me and strengthened me. They replaced the fear and uncertainties in my mind that I'd battled against. There's nothing magic about words and verses, but there is power in them because they're God's words. His life, his words are life words, soothing to our soul, calming our spirits 
and bringing change into our lives. In this time of fear and uncertainty, because of the coronavirus and economic uncertainty, we can live in peace. And as Nahum 1.7 reads, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. And Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord himself goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Isaiah 43 verse 1, don't fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And Psalm 91, verses 14 to 16. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him, I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. If you haven't already, familiarise yourself with all of Psalm 91 until it becomes a part of you. Speak it out, because it's only then that it becomes the double-edged sword. And as you do, you'll no doubt find that fear will fly out the window and faith will settle in your spirit. The promises here in this psalm are for God's people. We are indeed blessed. Jesus' last words to us in Matthew 28, uh, verse 20, were, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is focused on us. On a recent birthday, Dean gave me a wall hanging, well, I actually chose it, which spells out what I know to be true for myself and I'm sure also for you. It says, in Christ alone, my hope is found, based on Psalm 62 verse 5, which is, my soul finds rest in God, my hope comes from him. How true is this? He is our hope. And as we focus on him, he'll bring us through whatever life throws at us. Peter walked on water while he had his eyes fixed on Jesus. It was only when he took his eyes away that he began to sink. And it's easy for us to sink and to think sometimes that the Christian walk is too hard. We need to read our Bibles more. We need to pray harder. We need to do this. Don't do that. And we can become discouraged. My earliest memories are of church life when I got to float the appropriate number of ducks in the little bowl on each birthday and sit in the birthday seat. I still remember fondly such simple, happy memories. As I grew, though, I had this picture of a God who was like a stern judge, who was looking down on me with a frown, and that when I died, he'd have a score car, scored card and add it up to see if I had more ticks and crosses, and I thought, I'm surely going to end up in hell. Very scary for a little girl. It was only as a young mother and struggling with life, barely able to function, that I cried out to God one night in desperation to help me, that I was baptised in the Holy Spirit and my world was tipped upside down. I woke the next day and the grass was greener, my heavy load had been lifted and I was changed. And I have to tell you that from, from that time on, I went from what I thought God and church were to a loving relationship which lasts to this day. No, I found it isn't about the ticks and the crosses and, a God, and God wearing a frown. Instead, it was about the God who created the universe, who loved me, and it blew my mind. There have been huge challenges since, but never have I had to face them on my own. Deuteronomy 6.5 says... Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. We are called into a life of intimacy with our God and Jesus, not a life of rules. We're called into relationship to put him above all else in our lives. As our Bible verse said, we're to determine to throw off everything that would hinder us and to travel light. These may be habits, pleasures, and self-indulgences that would hold us back. Do we really want to hang on to these? Is our gaze focused in these areas or on Jesus and our faith walk? I reckon we can answer this even more truthfully after our lives have been shaken through the virus and the ensuring restrictions. Is our gaze focused towards Jesus and the prize ahead that we've promised? James 1.2 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to all those who love him. And 2 Timothy 4.8, 
Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have longed for his coming. And Revelation 3.11, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one can take your crown. 1 Peter 5.4, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. There's a picture in Revelation Chapter 4, verse um, 4. Of the 24 elders dressed in white with crowns of gold on their heads. What an awesome scene. For those who persevere, who, as Paul said, press on toward the goal to win the prize, there is the promise of a crown of life or a crown of righteousness. For those who who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Saviour, we have within us the Holy Spirit who enables us to run well. Jesus said in John 14, 25 to 26, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. And John 14, 18, For he dwells with you and will, he dwells with you and will be in you. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are saved, sealed, filled and sanctified. He reveals God's thoughts, teaches and guides us into all truth, including knowledge of what is to come. He also helps us in our weakness and intercedes for us. We have all we need to finish the race well, and perhaps the most important thing is to determine. I saw a video clip recently, and the woman was talking about climbing a mountain, and she gave a vivid description of it. As she and her husband neared the, neared the hardest part of the climb and their bodies were screaming out in pain, she said that it was the strength of the determination that brought them to the top of the mountain. I was impacted by those words. That determination brought strength to endure. So today we can ask ourselves, are we determined to endure? Are the words we sang in our first song applicable to us? With every breath I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day I know that he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. What is there in this life that could be more important than fixing our eyes on the eternal goal? Runners in ancient times ran for an olive wreath to be placed on their heads, one that would fade and that wouldn't last. What we run for is eternal And we're told in our Bible verse that we have a great cloud of witnesses spurring us on. Jesus wore a crown of thorns and because he fulfilled his goal, we are each to benefit and we're offered a crown of life and eternity forever. As we are fully equipped with our armour, with our counsel of the Holy Spirit empowering us, let's determine to focus on Jesus and in so doing, get for ourselves this crown of life and the words well done good and faithful servant let's pray Jesus we just pause in your presence and pray that you will speak to our hearts and show us where indeed our gaze is if it's not on your on you lord will you reset our focus draw us closer to yourself if our focus is already on you take us deeper into all you have planned for us Give us the ability to hear you way clearer than we can hear the world. May we spend whatever time we have here on earth soaring as eagles and not birds scratching on the ground. Thank you, Jesus, that because you wore a crown of thorns, we get to wear a crown for all eternity. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. We're going to close our service now singing the hymn, um, Jesus, All for Jesus. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be.
May the Holy Spirit place within each of us the determination to focus on Jesus and finish the race well. May we bring others along with us and let his will be done in each of our lives. Amen.